Hello, everyone. This is Stephen Massa with the Water Environment Federation. I want to welcome each of you to the Modern Oxidation Ditch, or Not Just Going in Circles, he showcase. Before we begin, I would like to quickly review a few logistics. During this webcast, while you cannot speak directly to the presenters, you will have an opportunity to submit questions by typing your specific question into the GoToWebinar pane that appears on the right-hand side of your computer screen. I will be accumulating questions and will direct them to the presenters at the end. The PDF PowerPoint presentations are currently available in the Handouts pane of the GoToWebinar panel. A link will also be included in the follow-up email sent 24 hours after the webcast has ended. We will be recording this e-showcase. The recording link will be available on the webcast website 24 hours after the webcast has ended. PDH credits are not available for this event. Please note that today's event is an e-showcase and does not necessarily reflect the views of the Water Environment Federation. If you have any additional questions after the webcast has ended, please email webcasts at webs.org. Today's speakers are Mike Doyle and Sergio Pino Yelchik. Mike is a senior process engineer with Avaqua and has over 38 years of experience in the field of water and wastewater process design and operation. He received his BS in chemical engineering at the University of Notre Dame and an MS in civil and environmental engineering at the University of Wisconsin. Mike is a licensed PE in the state of Wisconsin. Sergio is a technical sales manager with Avaqua and has over 19 years experience in the wastewater industry. He has held various technical positions in the United States, Italy, Spain, and Chile. He holds an MS degree in Civil and Environment Engineering from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So Mike and Sergio, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, thanks very much, Steve. Um, and thanks to everyone online for taking time out of your busy schedules to attend this webinar. Uh, today, we'll be presenting the current state of the art for oxidation ditch technology and show how this process, which was developed back in the 1950s, is still very applicable to today's treatment goals. Um, we'll talk about oxidation ditches generically, but give a particular focus to the Orbel multi-channel oxidation ditch. Uh, okay, <laughs> sorry for the technical difficulty. Um, this is an aerial photo showing one of uh, Evoqua's largest uh, installations in Springfield, Illinois. And I like this picture because many of you might be looking at the photo and wondering where are the oxidation ditches? Uh, in fact, there are looped flow reactors in this picture, but the configuration is uh, a little bit different than what a conventional oxidation ditch uh, that you're used to seeing looks like. So we'll explain uh, the configuration later on in the, in the uh, webinar. Uh, before we look at where we are, let's look backwards a little bit at uh, some of the history and uh, review of the oxidation ditch technology. It was first used in, uh, in Holland in the 1950s and as a result became known as the Dutch ditch. It was developed by uh, Dr. Passveer, who was really a, a true pioneer in biological treatment processes and, and oxygen transfer, working at the uh, Research Institute for Public Health Engineering. Uh, sometimes referred to as TNO in the literature. Uh, the first installation was actually in Vorschatten in uh, 1954, so there's a little trivia for you. Um, Holland, uh, much of Holland is actually below sea level, and as you might imagine, groundwater table is quite high, so these ditches tended to be very shallow, uh, maybe one and a half meters, four to five feet deep, uh, very often, uh, simple earthen basins, as you see in the in the photo, uh, side sloped uh, and uh, very low construction costs. Um, the uh, aeration uh, was a horizontal brush type of aerator, a Kessner brush uh, invented by Kessner and Ribius, and uh, that horizontal brush uh, or paddle would impart motion to, to circulate flow around the ditch, keep suspended solids, uh, keep the solids in suspension and provide aeration at the same time. So a very uh, uh, reliable um, aeration method. And the process was really developed at a time when most plants had primary treatment um, and short, short sludge ages for a kind of a minimal BOD and TSS removal. 
this was really one of the first true extended aeration processes. So low load, about 15 pounds a day per thousand cubic foot organic loading rate, long HRT. They'd run at high mixed liquor solids for a very long SRT and a, and a low yield. Uh, it really eliminated the primary treatment. You generally just go through screening and grit separation right into the ditch. So you remove primary treatment and the ditch really did uh, sludge digestion and treatment at the same time so that they could uh, take the stable, stabilized sludge and, and spread it on land. So the bottom line, it was very easy to operate, very uh, operator friendly, eliminate a lot of unit processes. And being an extended aeration process, uh, it, it achieved excellent BOD, TSS, and ammonia removal, but uh, often nitrates were quite high. There are very little phosphorus removal because they were essentially minimizing the wasting out of the process. And so a question arises today, um, is this technology developed back almost 70 years ago really relevant anymore? Uh, and we get this question asked actually uh, a fair, fair amount. Uh, it's old and outdated. Okay, it was good for BOD, TSS, and ammonia, but what about uh, total uh, nutrient removal uh, and uh, nitrogen phosphorus removal? Uh, this, the conventional ditch was very shallow, uh, occupied a lot of land, and uh, I, again, is that appropriate for today, today's population? And what about energy efficiency? Well, the process did develop, of course, the technology developed over the years, uh, started to become implemented in deeper uh, basins with, with concrete uh, sidewalls. The aeration imp equipment was improved to become more energy efficient, more mechanically reliable. Uh, the design and operation was modified to provide not only high quality effluent with BOD, TSS, and ammonia, but also uh, total nitrogen removal. Uh, so, as it developed back about uh, 20 years or so ago, uh, the Water Environment Research Foundation, WERF, uh, took a look at really the state of the art for nitrogen removal in oxidation ditches, kind of asking the same question, uh, how relevant is it to uh, the ongoing BNR regulations that were coming into play? And Dr. Stencil and, and Tom Coleman uh, reviewed uh, installations by really three major manufacturers at, at the time. Uh, Veolia, was, uh, who had the Kruger Biodenitro or, or phased isolation ditch. Uh, Ovivo, and at the time it was IMCO with the, the carousel process, um, which actually was uh, introduced by DHV uh, into this country, and that technology came from Holland appropriately. And finally, the Orbal system by Evoqua at the time in Virex. That one also, interestingly not, came from Holland uh, indirectly via South Africa and was known as the Huisman Orbal at the time. So looking at many installations, what they found was that the well-designed and operated plants could uh, achieve in the neighborhood of uh, five milligrams per liter of total inorganic nitrogen. And many of the plants actually had less than three milligrams per liter uh, TIN. Uh, typically, uh, they had very good settling and thickening sludge. And uh, DO control was, was generally needed to help match uh, flow and load variations and to prevent over aeration, which, which could be uh, detrimental to good denitrification. They categorized the, the three manufacturers' uh, ability to remove total nitrogen with three different methods. One was a control technology that was used by Kruger with the phased isolation ditch in which flow is actually diverted from one uh, reactor to another running in series, the first ditch running as a denitrification process and the second ditch then running as a, as a your nitrification and that flow would then be switched back and forth to alternate the uh, denite and night between the two ditches. Uh, IMCO's uh, carousel or Ovivo's carousel used uh, a process that was similar to the MLE process with a pre-anoxic tank. Flow from the, from the channel was diverted into a, this pre-anoxic tank uh, for uh, uh, nitrification or denitrification up front of the nitrification process. 
And then Evoqua, with the Orbel system, used a process known as simultaneous nitrification denitrification. And I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Sergio, to give you a little bit on the fundamentals of uh, simultaneous night denight. Right. Thank you, Mike, and uh, thank you, everybody on the line. So um, let's now dive into, you know, simultaneous nitrification, denitrification, or SND, which is really the backbone of uh, our design philosophy for oxidation ditches. So I want to start with the fundamentals. I want to share the process, the fundamental behind the process, how we control it, and then later through this presentation, we will get into how we have implemented this S and D process uh, with technology through oxidation ditches. So I want to start with uh, you know the simple schematic that you can see in your screen. Uh, the secondary treatment, very typical. You have an influent coming to a bioreactor, followed by a secondary clarifier, uh, producing an, a, a secondary effluent. So what we do here with S and D, as you can see, first I want to have reactors in series. It's part of our DNA and you know, all our design philosophy have reactors in series. I will talk about that through the presentation. In the upfront reactors of this multi-stage uh, configuration, we will run it under uh, an environment that we call aerated anoxic. That means that we are supplying aeration, but it's mild aeration, low intensity aeration. So the DO and this aerated anoxic bioreactor is virtually zero in those upfront reactors. So what do we get with this environment? What we're driving is S and D. That process upfront where we take the ammonia coming in the influent, we oxidize it to nitrate, and at the same time, we're reducing those nitrates into nitrogen gas through denitrification. So all this, this process occur at the front end of the plant with high substrate, high ammonia, high BOD, and even with a high FM ratio for better flock for formation. So all that drives a lot of efficiency that we'll, we will go through uh, throughout this presentation. So what is the result? What are the uh, key elements that you see here that are different than the conventional system, right? Number one, you don't see a dedicated anoxic basin. We aerate the entire process train with different intensities. Number two, there is no need for an internal recycle uh, to bring nitrate from the aerobic reactor at the tail end back to the front end. About 80% of TN removal can be done up front uh, with this S and D process. And, and as you can see in this process configuration, at the tail end, we will have an aerobic reactor, a truly aerobic reactor, where we ramp up the DO up to two uh, to polish uh, and make sure uh, that we have you know, the whole process without any deficiency in terms of oxygen. The other element that we can achieve in S and D is biological phosphorus. We'll talk about that through this presentation. It's all depend on how much aeration we put in those upfront reactors. So you can see here, uh, to drive S and D, we need to understand how to generate this aerated anoxic environment. This is really the key, the key platform to, to promote this S and D process. So in the next few slides, I'm gonna spend a, a little bit of time uh, going to the details of this aerated anoxic environment. What is it, right? What is aerated anoxic? It's really an environment in a bioreactor in which we deliver less oxygen than the oxygen demand. The oxygen demand is coming with your BOD, the ammonia, the aerobic respiration, all that the system is requiring, you know, in terms of demanding for oxygen. And we will deliver, on average, less than 75% of that. That condition only occurs at the upfront reactor in this multi-stage configuration where we have, again, high substrates driving high efficiencies. In the last reactor of this multi-stage configuration, we will have low substrate, and we will ramp up the DO to have an actual you know, residual DO that means we're gonna be delivering more oxygen than the oxygen demand. This uh, graph illustrates very well the concept. So on your left, you have pound of oxygen per hour or kilograms per hour. We will have three bioreactors in series, starting with the reddit anoxic uh, SND bioreactor, and ending the process with uh, a truly aerobic reactor. In blue here, you can see the oxygen demand. Again, this is coming in your BOD, the ammonia you have to oxidize. And in red, you can see the oxygen delivered actually through the equipment. So as you can see, you know, in that first bioreactor with the reddit anoxic condition, we will deliver less oxygen than the oxygen demand. So again, 
driving S and D process and running those at very low DOs, at virtually zero. Then we have a swing reactor that helps us to you know handle the, the the monthly loads, peak loads, the weekly peak loads, and then at the end on a ramp up that uh, DO to about two to have a truly aerobic reactor. So um, I want to focus on that first reactor. Most of the treatment happens there, uh, and we're driving S and D without a DO really to control the process. You know, the question is how, how we control the this radiant and optic environment if the DO doesn't tell us much. Well, for years, we have used the oxidation reduction potential to really control that S and D process, the radiant and optic environment. And in simple terms, oxidation reduction potential gives you a sense uh, in a bioreactor if you have an environment more oxidizing, if you will, positive millivolt reading, versus a more reducing environment or the negative millivolt reading. So in this slide here in front of you, I want to describe how we use ORP, how we find that S and D range that we want to uh, be running this, those first bioreactors. Um, on top here, you have the typical, you know, environments that we see in bioreactors in our industry, you know, aerobic uh, to the right, the most uh, oxidizing environment, then anoxic environment, and to your left, uh, the anaerobic, you know, the anaerobic environment. Here below, different uh, processes. Uh, on your left, you know, deep anaerobic, you want to have biogas generation. And on the other side, extreme, the positive value, we have aerobic oxidation, rather more uh, oxidizing environment. So what is this S and D range that we're looking for to control the process, right? Uh, we have found that fall within probably negative 100 millivolt to negative 200 millivolt. That's the range that we have found that, as you can see in this graph, uh, a few processes overlap. So you can see nitrification, denitrification, and even phosphorus release can occur in this S and D range. Uh, so again, with this upfront reactor running in this uh, S and D mode, we can drive, you know, simultaneously several processes. And this is what we call the radiant anoxic environment. Uh, the equipment, you know, reads the ORP uh, readings and through VFDs can control the oxygen delivered in those upfront reactors. So we have talked about, you know, the fundamental, the theory, what really sustains the process. Uh, I want to share with you long-term data. I think long-term data, you know, speaks for itself, validate all this theory that we're going through this uh, presentation. I want to show here data uh, from the Saline Creek facility in Fenton, Missouri. It's actually eight years of data. They have a, a very com a comprehensive uh, sampling program. And what I want to show here is the percentage removal of the ammonia load coming into the bioreactor, right? The inflow and ammonia load and how it's removed through each bioreactor. This plant gets about 600 pounds per day of ammonia coming into the bioreactor in the form of TKM. So I want to show here uh, three bioreactors in series, and again, the percentage removal of that ammonia coming in in each bioreactor. As you can see in the outer channel, of first bioreactor receiving that raw waste water, on average, you know, again, eight years of plant data, we have seen about 60% of the ammonia coming in into that first reactor is nitrified up front with this low DO environment, the rated anoxic environment. And about 100% of those uh, nitrate form in that first stage get denitrified right away. We're working again with high substrate, high ammonia it's in, the, in the raw influent, high BOD that can drive this, uh, these processes. Throughout these eight years of plant data, the average ORP in that first uh, bioreactor was negative 200 millivolt. Again, there is virtually no DO in that reactor, but yet we are net nitrifying most of that ammonia that's coming into the bioreactor. The average NOx, meaning nitrite and nitrate, in that first reactor is less than one. So it can prove the fact that all that ammonia that gets nit nitrified, at the same time we can denitrify with the high BOD in that uh, process. Nitrification always gives us nice credit. Uh, as most of you know, uh, it consumes BOD. Uh, essentially, we don't have to aerate or oxidize the BOD. It gets consumed by the reduction of nitrate. And also, it can uh, recover alkalinity that is consumed in nitrification. So again, denitrification credits are always good things to have. Looking at this uh, process here, uh, we have the middle bioreactor channel. And at the end, I have, uh, as I have mentioned before, we have a truly aerobic reactor, in this case, uh, a polishing reactor, right, with a DO of about two. 
And these plants, again, for eight years have generated uh, about a TN of five milligrams per liter. So this is the plant data that really validates all the, the, the fundamental, the process behind S and D and how we design oxidation dishes. Now I want to move into the technology and how we have implemented, again, all this fundamental, the process into technology throughout the last probably 40 years. And I want to start with the Orbal system. Mike mentioned that uh, early on in the introduction. Uh, really the foundation of all what we know, all what we have learned, experienced with uh, oxidation dishes at Evoqua. It was introduced uh, more than 40 years ago. It's a multi-channel oxidation dish operated in series. Again, the tank in series, part of the DNA, the backbone of our uh, design philosophy. In this case, the outer channel, as you can see in this picture, is you know, the uh, classical uh, configuration of the orbital uh, reactor with concentric channels. The first channel, the outer channel, is the first reactor that gets that raw wastewater. It will be operated under the aerated and oxygen environment, driving S and D. Typical flow for an orbital system, uh, so far, you know, we have seen most of our plants fall with less than 3 MGD, probably. We have plants up to 25, 26 MGD. In terms of uh, the depth of the tank, we can get down up to 16, uh, almost five meters side water depth. And as I said, you know, it's the foundation of all what we know about oxidation ditches. Over 800 installations, we have seen, I would say, virtually any condition that you can imagine. We have plants here in Wisconsin, uh, fully night to fine with water temperatures below four degrees C's. And on the other side of the spectrum, we have an orbital plant at the Dead Sea in Israel uh, in the middle of the desert with a mixed liquid temperature of 33 degrees Celsius. So again, a lot of experience, uh, lesson learned that we uh, implement now, you know, in the, in the modern oxidation ditches. So now I want to jump a little bit into the, the details, the mechanics of the orbital system. These are the pictures that I think most of you are familiar with. Um, I want to spend just a few minutes talking about the internals. Uh, this is a plan view of a classical orbital system. In this case, we have three concentric channels, three is a typical number. We have done uh, two channels, uh, three, four, up to five. So in this case, the first channel is that outer channel, uh, gets the influence, the raw with water and the RAS, and it, it's through internal ports, get transferred from the first channel to the second, to the third, and from there to the second that it clarifies. In terms of the process, you can see here that outer channel, again, the upfront reactor, is where we drive S and D. We have the relevant and oxygen environment, virtually no DO. We control this through ORP. Then we have a swing reactor, and at the end, the truly aerobic reactor before going to the clarifiers. The key element here, and again, talking about technology that drives, makes all this happen, is the orbital disk. And we'll talk about the orbital disk, how it has evolved throughout 40 years. Uh, but in essence, I can tell you, our design philosophy always has been um, to produce a, an aeration that is very mild and low intensity. The orbital disc can uh, deliver the aeration and also mixing in this configuration. So as I said, you know, the orbital system has been the, the, the foundation of what we have done in the last 40 years with oxidation ditches. But at some point, you know, we got, we got challenged into apply this technology uh, into rectangular tanks, right? Uh, traditionally, and as Mike mentioned, you know, it's been a racetrack, oval shaped oxidation dishes for, for many, many years. But in the, in the 80s, we started getting into rectangular tanks, how we can really use all the, the fundamentals behind the orbital system, the uh, orbital disk, the racetrack, S and D, and take that and put it in a, a rectangular, rectangular tank. So in the next few slides, I'm gonna uh, tell you the story, how we, um, again, created an, uh, um, another alternative treatment uh, based on the orbital system, but now that we can address rectangular tanks. So the first system I want to address is the vertical loop reactor system. The VLR system was introduced in 1986. And as you can see in these pictures, uh, we don't have the classical oxidation dish here, right? Shape, the oval shape. Uh, now we have rectangular reactors, always operated in series. Uh, we're still keeping the high circulation, the race track concept. I will show you that in a second. Uh, but this is the most innovative oxidation ditch that we have developed in terms of uh, configuration for rectangular reactors. With this configuration, we can go deeper, uh, up to 25 feet side water depth, or 7.6 meters. And we can certainly address larger plants uh, because now we can reduce footprint, we can use common walls. Um, in this case, our largest plant is about 40 MGD, 
So about 150, 160 MLD. So again, that was the first introduction of a, a true innovation in an oxidation this in industry with rectangular tanks. 12 years after this, uh, we decided to uh, keep you know, that innovation aspect and we developed a vertical system. So it's a step forward now looking strictly at how to maximize aeration efficiency throughout the entire process train. And we developed something that we call it hybrid aeration. And we'll talk about that later, but essentially, you know, we're combining uh, the VLR system, mechanical aeration, the orbital disc up front, treating raw with water, followed by a second stage of treatment with fine bubble diffusers before going to the secondary clarifiers. So we'll go through the vertical system, but I think again, these, these two systems, the VLR vertical, are probably the most innovative uh, advancement in oxidation ditches, just because we're changing, you know, the shape of these tanks, and again, we can address larger plants. A little bit of the details, the mechanics. Uh, on the, this slide, you can see the vertical loop reactor, the VLR, again, rectangular tanks. We have a plant view on top and a section view at the bottom. Um, again, we're keeping the orbital concept here. So tanking series, the influent and RAS, we go through the first tank, a red anoxic environment, low DO, S and D, and then we go to the swing reactor, and then finally a third reactor with um, a truly aerobic condition at the of about two, and then from there to the secondary clarifiers. At the bottom here, I think the most innovative aspect of this oxidation dish, if you will, it is the vertical loop. Essentially, there is a horizontal buffer we're using the orbital disk to aerate and mix, generate that high circulation uh, hydraulic pattern, right, uh, to drive a, a completely mixed reactor in that uh, first VLR. As I said before, we can get deeper with this configuration, up to 25 feet as sidewater of that. And in terms of the, the basing uh, width, it's about 30 feet or 9.1 meters. Uh, this also applies to the orbital process as well. So again, we're really uh, taking the best of the orbital process, the S and D, aerated and oxic, and, and translate it into a rectangular tank application. The next step, as I said, you know, was to develop a hybrid duration process, uh, vertical, and I'm showing here a simple schematic. Uh, but essentially, you know, we have two stages. Number one would be uh, a vertical loop reactor with mechanical aeration, the orbital disk, treating raw uh, wastewater, and then a second stage with fine bubble diffusers, and from there to the clarifiers. With this, again, we're maximizing the aeration transfer throughout the process, the alpha factor, and I want to transfer over to Mike, who's going to tell us the why and the benefit of the aeration energy or transfer aspect of our processes. Okay, thanks, Sergio. Okay. A little bit of a delay there. Okay, um, I'll pick up the pace a little bit here. We've got a little bit to cover before we're, we're finished. But uh, in terms of clean water transfer efficiency, if you look at a low speed or a disc aerator, mechanical surface aerator, you're looking at about three and a half pounds of oxygen per brake horsepower hour, about 2.1 kilograms per kilowatt hour. Fine bubble diffuser is about two, almost three times as high. And so with just based on clean water transfer efficiency, you would say fine bubble would win every time. Got it. Okay. But we're transferring oxygen into dirty water, mixed liquor, and we need to make uh, corrections to the clean water transfer characteristics. Uh, there's a number of them. I won't dwell on this in a lot of detail. You can review that offline if you're not familiar with it, but there's pressure and and temperature corrections to be made to the saturation and, and the KLA. Uh, but the biggest factors are the operating DO, the alpha factor, which is the ratio of the mass transfer coefficient in wastewater to, to clean water, and a falling factor. Let's look at DO first. Uh, Sergio mentioned the benefits, the process benefits of simultaneous night denight in terms of nitrification and denitrification, but there's some very significant energy benefits as well. If you look at this graph, you can see that the higher the operating DO, the greater the increase in aeration power required to maintain that DO. So operating at zero DO gives you the, the maximum efficiency of a device. If you operate at two, you're losing almost 30% uh, or you're required to go to about 30% more power for surface aeration. Diffused aeration, a little bit less, about 20%, but about 20 to 30% at the two DO. Dr. Michael Stenstrom at UCLA has done a lot of really good work on 
the alpha factor and falling factor on fine bubble diffusers. And it's summarized in, in this slide. Uh, on the left, you can see a graph um, starting off in a new or clean condition, fine bubble aeration devices, roughly a factor, uh, alpha factor of 0.5. It varies quite a bit depending on your mixed liquor concentration, your sludge age, where in the treatment process you're located, uh, with the front of a long narrow tank, it's uh, going to be a lower alpha factor. Um, at the back end, it's going to be higher, but very roughly in, the, in a 0.5 range. As time goes on, you can see after one or two years of operation, that alpha factor may drop to 0.4 or lower. Continue to go on without any cleaning, uh, can be down around 0.3. And the picture on the right shows you an, a, a nice uh, uh, graph or a nice uh, uh, pictorial view of what's happening with that biofilm on the left side. As you, you can see, when fine bubble diffuser becomes fouled over, the bubble size increases. If you clean it, uh, you get the nice fine bubble again and your transfer efficiency goes back up. But the point is you have to clean the fine bubble diffusers uh, or you're going to lose a lot of transfer efficiency. Now contrast this with a horrible disc aerator or a mechanical surface aerator, vertical uh, shaft turbine or, or a brush has the same characteristics. There's no decrease in performance over time. In other words, the following factor is one. The mode of transfer is much different. Uh, it's uh, droplets and, and entrained air compared to uh, blowing air through fine pores, which can become fouled with bioslime. So alpha, so your, fact, your following factor is always one. You also have a very high alpha factor, close to one, 0.85, 0.95, compared to fine bubble diffusers, which are Alpha is about half or lower. And so you can see that in mixed liquor, dirty water, uh, your surface aerator starts to become pretty close to a fine bubble device in terms of transfer efficiency. There's other benefits with a uh, surface aerator. You've got good turn up and turn down capabilities, really li limited only by the VFD. There's a lot of flexibility in the case of a disc aerator to add or remove discs. Everything's above the water line, so there's no need to dewater the tank to maintain the equipment. Long mechanical life, and you get aeration in addition to mixing. With fine bubble aeration and a looped type of reactor, you need a submersible mixer. Here, with surface aerators, you don't. So we can use then our uh, reactors in series without having to worry about low alpha factor or fouling uh, in that outer channel. We can dedicate the zone for good control of DO to get our simultaneous night denight. Uh, reactors in series eliminates the impact of short circuiting. If you get a little bit of raw wastewater that uh, bypasses the first channel, you catch it and mix it in the second channel and in the third channel. Uh, you get an F to M gradient, which provides uh, uh, a good uh, uh, environment to reduce sludge bulking. Your reactor kinetics increase or improve because of a high substrate in the outer reactor. It's plug flow kinetics, we call it, or anything that has a first order react reaction is uh, improved with a reactors in series approach. And there's some really great operational flexibility to be able to handle storm flows uh, with a multi channels in series. You can divert your raw wastewater to the inner channel and, and keep your mixed liquor in your outer channel during high flow periods. So we can uh, arrange these reactors in a, a variety of configurations then to get the treatment quality that we need. Uh, small flows, two reactors in series, can get down close to uh, 10 TN. Conventional orbital system with three reactors in series will give you less than 10 TN, typically in the seven to eight range with less than one phosphorus. Um, if we need to go lower on total nitrogen, we can implement internal recycle, somewhat similar to MLE. Um, that can have a bit of a deleterious effect on phosphorus removal. So if we need to go, go low TN and low phosphorus, you can add an anaerobic selector up front. And then finally, to achieve state-of-the-art uh, um, ENR, less than three TN, less than one milligram per liter, we can add a post-anoxic step as well to really get the state-of-the-art uh, 
nitrogen and phosphorus removal. Okay, so the, the modern ditch then, uh, we can get the, the treatment quality that we need in, in a very uh, cost-effective and energy-efficient manner. But what about uh, the old ditches that are out there? Well, we can often case uh, retrofit those to, uh, to get to our current treatment needs. And here's a good case study from Corinth, Mississippi. The original design was three parallel uh, conventional single channel oxidation ditches. These had the uh, internal uh, the boat clarifiers, the uh, in interchannel clarifiers, and brush aerators. And the challenge here was that the plant capacity needed to be increased from six to eight MGD, and they had to now hit nutrient removal limits. And rather than building a brand new treatment plant, we were able to operate the three ditches now in series as an aerated anoxic type process that Sergio discussed, converted the old brushes to the efficient disc aerators, added circular clarifiers and got rid of the intra-channel bulk clarifiers. And uh, as a result, the first two years of operation at this plant have shown uh, TN less than six milligrams per liter with less than one milligram per liter phosphorus on a consistent monthly basis without the addition of chemicals. Yeah, with that, uh I want to recap a little bit the model oxidation dish presentation just to finalize this webinar today. Um, number one, we have a robust BNR treatment. I think we have uh, proven, you know, getting to TN, TP uh, in the ENR level, you know, enhanced nutrient removal, less than 3TN, less than 1 phosphorus, all biologically speaking. Uh, the way how we do it here at the Volcua, right? Uh, as I said before, we promote this S and D and, uh, process through the related anoxic condition or P control. And I, I would like you to remember how we change the treatment profile for treatment plant, treating the majority of that ammonia uh, or nitrogen up front, and then finally, you know, at the end of the process, just polishing um, uh, the whole treatment. We have denitrification credits. If we have S and D, denitrification will always occur. That means free BOD consumed and alkalinity recovered, as, as explained uh, before. Part of this S and D process, right, help us to virtually eliminate internal recycles. There is no need to bring a nitrate from the tail end of the process to be uh, denitrified at the front end. Up to 80% of that TN uh, can be removed uh, without an internal recycle. On the energy aspect, as Mike described, right, we are delivering the majority of this oxygen at low DO condition, you know, those upfront reactors. And that drives significant, you know, uh, energy uh, efficiency. And as you can see here, 20 to 30% less aeration energy is expected. Only at the tail end of the process is when we operate uh, the bioreactor with a high DO. But again, most of that oxygen uh, is delivered at the front end with low DO conditions. Tanking series is another part of our DNA on how we do oxidation ditches, provide flexibility and better storm flow management. And as I say at some point, right, we're always getting creative. Uh, we now have deep rectangular tanks, hybrid duration, different options to really fit any treatment challenge, footprint challenge uh, that we can, uh, you know, reach with these technologies. So with that, um, I think I want to transfer over to you, Steve. So you can facilitate uh, some questions that we may have. All right, thank you, uh, Sergio and Mike, for your presentation today. Uh, we do have a few questions coming in, so we will uh, get to as many of those we can as we can in the next five minutes or so. Um, but please feel free to sub continue to submit questions. Uh, we will send along uh, those questions that we aren't able to get to. Um, we will send those along. Uh, to the presenters and they can follow up directly. So uh, as I said, feel free to continue submitting questions uh, until we uh, until we log off. Uh, all right. So just to go down the list, do you grow low DO filaments? Yeah, not not typically. Um, operating at uh, close to zero DO actually provides an environment that the filaments uh, don't thrive in particularly well. Uh, we also get the nice F to M gradient, as we mentioned, so that outer channel uh, doesn't tend to form filaments uh, 
certainly there are, are plants that have problems with filaments like any plant, but uh, by and large, we, we get pretty very good SVIs. And remember, the, the final reactor is always a truly aerobic reactor. So we're making sure that there is not a whole, you know, oxygen de uh, deficient condition throughout the process. Okay, thank you. Uh, all right, the next, our next question, uh, influent ammonia is 600 pounds per day. What is the ammonia concentration? Oh, for the plant that we have, oh, good question. Um, I would I want to say probably in the 30 range. Yeah, 30, 35. Yeah. Um, so we did, the mass balance that we did was intentionally done on mass balance, yeah. right, pounds per, per day. I think that's the most objective right. way to do it. It's a conventional municipal plant, right. about 30, 35 milligrams per liter. Okay, excellent. Um, I think you probably covered this a little bit towards the end, but uh, in case there was anything else that you wanted to discuss on this, um, can you retrofit existing basins? At, well, as, as we showed, at, absolutely. Uh, and we do that quite a bit. There's so much existing uh, infrastructure uh, that, you know, with the concrete being in good condition, um, the process really is quite adaptable uh, and uh, suitable for upgrade. All right, excellent. All right, uh, in the VLR, how do operators clean the bottom half of the tank below the baffle? Well, we have the mixing energy there. I, I don't think that it's a need really to get down. That's the whole premise of the process, right? Every, right. All the equipment is on top of the tank. Yeah, uh, yeah. for the most part, we, we try and maintain uh, similar velocities in, in that one foot per second range uh, uh, above and below the, the baffle, so. Okay. All right. Um, could you speak towards whether or not uh, two orbital oxidation ditches are required to meet state redundancy requirements? Quite often not, uh, in that that outer channel is 50% of the of the volume. So we can set up the the tanks so that if you dewater any one of the channels, you're you're taking uh, less than 50% of the of the volume out, and by doing that, uh, we can we can meet redundancy requirements. All right, excellent. Uh, is there a specific use case that oxidation ditches are best suited for? Uh, for example, certain MGDs, certain wastewater strengths, certain climates, etc. The reversal. I mean, we have shown. I guess you know we can get to new plant, existing plant. Yeah. Low temperature for nitrification. I mean, for the orbital, for the orbital in general, I think somewhere in that three MGD range is, yeah, you know, 0. 0.5 to three is sort of a, a, a nice sweet spot. Uh, for the VLR, we've gone much bigger, uh, up to 30 uh, or 40 MGD. Yeah. Uh, uh, temperature wise, we've we've operated at you know anywhere from the extremes of uh, Wisconsin or northern Minnesota to uh, the high temperatures of the Dead Sea mm -hmm. areas, as Sergio has mentioned. So it's broadly applicable temperature-wise. Yeah, municipal plant, also some industrial plants that we have. All right. All right, excellent, thank you. Uh, okay, how do you balance low DO in the first channel with the mixing energy needed to keep the settling velocity up? Uh, that's a great question. Um, the, the configuration of the ditches and the Mixing efficiency of the disc aerator really go hand in hand, and uh, we're able to mix that outer channel uh, typically uh, with one horsepower, uh, 100 to 200,000 gallons of uh, volume can be mixed with a single horsepower. So uh, we we have very very good turndown capability. We can we can match a very low load and keep a good aerated anoxic environment um, with very little energy. All right, uh, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Uh, so which reactors and flow rates are needed for the internal recycle? Can you expand on what is required uh, for the anaerobic selector? So the internal recycle, I guess, nitrate, right? Correct. So I think, you know, when we have a very low TN limit to meet, then we will use some of the internal recycle, probably 200 or 300 Q. Correct, right. 
from the, the last reactor back to the, the rated anoxic reactor. Correct. Uh, we also have a variation of a passive baffle uh, that we, again, use it that high circulation, you know, the hydraulic pattern, we have a, a passive baffle that can uh, connect, you know, let's say the, the inner channel with the middle one, right? Or the middle to the outer. Right. That is a way that we can, you know, avoid pumps. Uh, there is some limitation on how much we can divert, but it's another option. Uh, in, for the question on the anaerobic uh, bioreactor, I would say just following the you know, traditional bio-P selector, if you will, about one hour, HRT. Right. And one of the things that we do is we will feed that anaerobic selector with mixed liquor from the outer channel, which is very close to zero nitrates. Right. So there's a, a benefit to uh, uh, keeping that the low, low anaerobic uh, low ORP anaerobic condition in the in the selector. Okay, uh, well, thank you guys very much. I think that's all the time we have for questions for today. Like I said, any uh, questions that we didn't get to, uh, we will forward them on to the speakers and they'll be able to respond directly to you uh, with any uh, follow-up. Uh, and there, of course, the uh, email contact are, is on the screen currently, so uh, you can feel free to follow up directly with uh, either of the speakers if you have any other questions. Um, I would like to thank everyone for attending today and uh, hope to see you at our next webcast event. Thank you, Steve.